Good day to everyone. This day, we're to talk on Malaysia software. To start with, let us first define different learning objectives that each, must, each of you must be able to attain by the end of this lesson. You should be able to gain an understanding of Malaysia software. You should be able to describe each type of Malaysia software. Differentiate viruses from worms. Explain the different stages that viruses go through and explain the components of a computer virus. And finally, describe each type of worms. Make sure to have with you this materials and equipment as we start this lesson. Well, this activity is intended for you to recall some instances where you have encountered malicious software. Use your assessment notebook to answer this part. Have you ever had an experience with a computer or a flash drive that has been infected with a malicious software like malware, viruses, worms, etc? I want you to write or I want you to share your experiences about encountering one of these malicious software. For our learning probe, this activity is intended to cite instances that you can tell whether a computer is already infected with malicious software. And then again, use your assessment notebook to answer this part. Well, how do you know that the computer is already infected with malicious software? I wanted to share your experiences on uh, knowing or identifying whether uh, your computer or how can you tell that your computer is now infected with a malicious software. And nowadays, malicious software has gained more attention than it deserved. Aside from that, malicious software is a concern though as we go along the, the digital age. This malicious software comes with the digital age where computers are now becoming more integral part of humanity. The effects of malicious software can range from simple to complex malicious actions. And when we say malicious software, these are actually programs or software programs de uh, deliberately created to harm computer systems. Therefore, they only have one target, which is to destroy and do harm to our computer system. And that's what they call generally as malicious software. And it can cause the computer to produce undesired information systems actions. Like for example, from uh, every minute or every second, you can see pop-ups or some, some unwanted pop-ups from your screen. Or perhaps your computer might be lagging. And this malicious software can spread from one system to another in different methods. And then one of these methods is what we call email. Now how does our malicious software th spread through an email? Now when you say email, this is one way to spread malicious software and it's a short for electronic messaging. And wherein some of this email contains some attachments, right? When we uh, sometimes we can receive emails with some attachments, and then when these attachments have been downloaded and opened on your computer, this malicious software has now been activated. So the moment you uh, download an attachment, which probably contains malicious software, when you open that attachment, the malicious software also gets activated. And once this malicious software is now activated, it can perform malicious actions on your computer. And that's how the spread of viruses spreads through email. This is done by downloading and clicking on the attachments. So make sure to verify whether this attachment is not infected with a malicious software. And make sure that your sender is one that he knows so that you can verify whether the file is safe for downloading. Then another method or other way in which a malicious software can spread is through the use of an infected floppy disk and flash drives. 
Now, long before the flash drive server became more popular, the floppy disk is a popular method for saving files, hence it is very portable. But um, as time passed by, floppy disks were now replaced with flash drives. And flash drives is now becoming more popular in terms of storage as it provides more portability and a bigger storage capacity as compared to floppy disk. And since they are becoming more portable, that means you can easily insert your flash drive from one computer to the other. And unknowingly, your flash drive is infected with viruses. And thus, by the moment you insert your flash drive to another computer, the virus or measure software also gets copied and spread on the computers in which a flash drive is being inserted. And again, the use of infected floppy disks and disk drives or flash drives can also spread the, the malicious software. Once you inserted an infected flash drive into your system, the malicious software can now start infecting the system to which it is attached. The other way in which a malicious software can spread is by downloading files or programs over the internet. Well, downloading files or programs over the internet also paves the way for your computer to be infected with a malicious software. Because some files and programs over the internet have malicious software attached to them. So the moment you install or open these files and programs, the malicious software also is installed in your system alongside with the program. And this way, the malicious software gets installed unknowingly. And sometimes take note that this malicious software gets attached to computer games unloaded or taken from an unknown source. And upon installing this software, the malicious software also gain an entrance to your system. So make sure to verify the source where you downloaded the file or programs for you to use in your computer. Otherwise, it paves that way. It paves the way for malicious software to get into your system. So make sure to carefully check the source of your downloaded file so that you can, after verifying them, you can feel secure that your computer will not be affected with a malicious software. Well, there are different classifications of malicious software. Firstly, we can classify malicious software whether they are independent or needs a host program. Suppose a malicious software needs a host program. So in that case, it means that Malicious software cannot stand on its own and cannot execute itself unless it attaches to programs or files. Again, that is what we call a, a malicious software which needs a host program. And again, it cannot stand on its own. Examples of this malicious software that needs a host program are the following. We have your trapdoors, logic bands, and viruses as well as Trojan or Trojan horses. And you also have your independent malicious software. So when you say independent malicious software, these are programs or malicious software which can operate and stand on its own. And it doesn't need a host program for this malicious software to get executed and this includes worms and zombies of this malicious software viruses worms and zomb zombies can replicate themselves this diagram presents the different types of malicious software and its classification whether it needs a host program or they are independent of themselves now let us take these types of malicious software one by one. We start with trapdoors. When we say trapdoors, these are also known as backdoors, where we're in there these are secret and undocumented entry to a program. And usually 
This trap door or back door are only used during the creation and development of a program. And once the program is already deployed and, in, and used, this trap door or back door should be closed. Okay? Because a trap door or back door is actually a feature in a program that can be accessed by some means other than the apparent direct call and perhaps with special privileges. Me to say, you, d you don't have to go through uh, entering a special credentials for you to gain access to this program. So there is a special way in which you can cr you can connect to these programs. And when you say uh, at the same time, it is also a hole in a in a security of a system deliberately left in place by designers or maintainers. And thus, since this is a hole in a security system, it it allows anyone those know how, those know how to access to bypass usual security procedures. And developers have commonly used these trapdoors. It is for them to easily maintain the program. But the same but the same time, by the use of trapdoors or backdoor, it is also considered as a, as a threat when these features are left in production programs allowing exploited by attackers. Hence every program or developer should uh, remove this trapdoor or backdoor once this program is now in production. And again, trapdoors are only useful during maintenance and development of a, of a computer program. When once a program is already once a program is already this, this, uh, deployed, this trapdoor should be removed because it paves the way for attackers to gain access to the system. And the only purpose of having a trapdoor is to bypass internal controls. And it is up to the uh, it is up to the attacker to determine how this circumvention of control can be utilized for his benefit. So the only way, again, trapdoor is just for an, an attacker to gain access to the system. And once attacker can now gain access to the system, it is for him to do whatever he do as he please to do in destroying the system. And also, we have also a means of activation, okay? And this, this activation key is under the control of the attacker. And a simple example of an, act, of an activation key is a unique sequence of characters that are encoded into a terminal, okay? So normally, a software trapdoor program embedded in this operating system code can recognize this key and allows the user of, a, of the particular terminal privileges. And it is done by software circumventing the regular features of the system. And to gain access to a specific program, the attacker will, is going to use a terminal. Okay? The terminal is just like a command line interface of an operating system, which allows you to connect to another computer located in different place. Okay? And to counter this trapdoor, good software development and updates should be practiced. And thus, it is always recommended that we, as users of a computer program, should always update our programs to patch these different security holes in our system. And examples of trapdoors are back orifice, rootkit, and ester eggs. And there are two types of trapdoors, which are namely the undetectable trapdoor and, hard and a hardware Trapdoor. In an undetectable trapdoor, the attacker can construct the trapdoor in such a manner as to make it virtually undetectable and to even suspecting investigators. And it is a significant concern of computer security for hardware trapdoor with security related hardware flaws. And then the fear is that the hardware processor might fail so that the processor would keep running. And security-related hardware checks will no longer be made because the hardware is already destroyed or damaged. And thus, the CPU is still running and the processor is still running, causing the system to malfunction. And for example, the failed hardware might allow a privileged instruction to be executed from a user program. So in that case, the hardware is now already um, distracted. 
So what is only what uh, what is running is now the processor, and since the processor can still run, any instructions fed to your processor can be executed. So in that case, the user can no longer check because uh, the user might suspect that the system is now failing because the hardware is now not working. But the truth is that the processor the processor is still working, and any instructions given to this processor can still be executed. Then another type of malicious software, again, when you say trapdoor, this is just a way to gain access and or to gain unauthorized access to a specific program or hardware. So the only problem here is that um, the only problem here is that anybody can gain access to that system if this trapdoor is not removed during the production phase of a computer chip program. And then the degree to which this and, and, the, and the degree to the damage of a trapdoor depends on what the attacker is going to do once you gain access to a hardware or gain access to a specific software. Then another example of a malicious software is what we call as logic bombs. And it is one of the oldest type of malicious software. And then the codes of logic bombs are embedded in a legitimate program. Take note class that they are embedded in a legitimate program. And these lines of codes are only activated upon the presence or absence of, fun of some file, date, or time, or user. So there is a specific instance or there is a criteria. When will this malicious software get activated? And then for examples of uh, logic bombs are Friday the 13th, April Fool's Day, etc. So in short, when you say logic bombs, they are only activated when some actions or conditions have been met. However, and moreover, it remains dormant until these codes are not triggered. Okay? So again, it is called a subject bomb because they are only executed when certain criteria or conditions have been met. And they remain dormant so long as these criteria or conditions had not been met. And then when triggered, this can damage the system by modifying or deleting files, hold the machine, and etc. So these are, uh, that's what they call logic bomb. Again, they are only activated once a certain code or time or conditions have been met. And once they are triggered, they can do damage to your computer system. So be careful again in installing software programs in your computer system because we don't know there's an embedded malicious software in that program, even though it is leg legitimate. Then another malicious software which needs a host is what they call Trojan Horses. Again, Trojan Horses also needs a host program before they can execute. And these are malicious programs with an expected additional functionality that includes harmful features that the user is not aware of. So it comes with a super, uh, superficially attractive software programs like a computer game, software upgrade, screensaver, or etc. So when these programs are run, they perform additional tasks like allowing the attacker to gain unauthorized access indirectly. So alongside with a legitimate computer program comes with a Trojan horse. So the difference is that when you say logic bomb, they're only activated upon a certain condition. But when you say Trojan horses, every time you run the program, the Trojan horses also gets activated, allowing the compute or the, uh, allowing the attacker to gain access to your computer system. So usually, Trojan horses comes into a, a superficially attractive software. Those attractive software like a skin server, a game, where you might want to play. So while playing, there is an additional functionality which allows attacker to gain access to your system and can damage your computer along the way. And some malicious software that are some malicious actions that a Trojan would do includes stealing passwords. So along, uh, while you do encode your username and password for your, to your bank accounts, this Trojan also logs your 
keystrokes. Therefore, you can get your username and password used to log into your bank accounts, key logging, etc. And they take note class that Trojan horses are neither self-replicating or propagating. And user assistance is required for inspection. And this program infects when a user installs and executes infected programs. So the moment you run a program which you have just recently installed in your computer system, the Trojan horses also gets activated. And that's how it works. And there are different types of Trojans. We'll talk each one of them. Firstly, you have your remote access Trojans. So it is called remote access because it allows the attacker to log in or to connect to your computer system remotely. So it takes full control of your computer system and pass it into the hacker. That's what they call remote access. And once the attacker or the hacker has now access to your computer system, he can now do whatever he can using your computer system. You can even delete files to format your computer or send emails using your computer. Then the main purpose of remote access Trojan is just for the attacker to gain full control of your computer system as well as its resources. Then another type of Trojan is what we call your data sending Trojan. Why is it called data sending? It is because this send data to the attacker. So in this case, a data sending Trojan sends data back to the, to the hacker through email. For example, we have your keylogger, which logs and transmits each keystroke. Therefore, every time you press a key from your keyboard, they are being logged and transmitted to the, back to the hacker. And that's what they call data sending Trojan, to keep logs of your keystrokes, or the log for your data. Then we have also your destructive Trojan. Well, of course, it has only one purpose, which is to destroy and delete files. And it is unlikely to be detected by antivirus software. So be careful of this destructive Trojan. Another one is we also have your denial of service attack Trojans. So why, uh, why is it called denial of service attacks? It is because uh, the server Okay, I guess you already know what a server is. It is our computers, which provide services to other computers in your network. And what, what it does is that once a Trojan makes use of denial of service attacks, the server is flooded with requests with no return address. Therefore, the request cannot be completed and it, and it runs repeatedly in a network, thereby consuming all network resources. And thus, and once all the network resources has been consumed, it, the server can now can no longer cater valid requests. And thus, there is denial of service attacks. So, a Trojan, which offers a denial of service attacks, means to say it attacks or it sends invalid requests to a server until such that the resources of the server will be consumed and it can no longer cater the request for valid users of a network. Then another type of Trojan is what we call your proxy Trojans. When you say proxy Trojans, it allows a hacker to turn a user's computer into his or host integration server intended to make purchases with stolen credit cards and run the criminal enterprises in a particular user's name. So this is the worst case because you will be charged of a crime where you do not really do. Because what it does is that it, the hacker is just using your computer to buy um, items using the stolen credit cards. Because there, there is a way in which your which a purchase can be traced using IP address. Okay, so in that case, since the IP address can be traced, that is why hackers are using other computer system to make purchases using the stolen credit card so that they cannot be traced. And they can also run other criminal activity using your 
account. So it's just a proxy. It's, it is using your computer to do criminal activities, to buy items using stolen credit, uh, stolen credit cards, or run some crimi ter uh, criminal activities, cyber crime activities in using your computer. And that's what they call proxy trojans. Then we also have your FTP trojans. So FTP, this, is, uh, this stands for File Transfer Protocol Trojans. So what does it do? This FTP Trojans exploits the port wherein the file transfer protocol is connected to. Okay, so normally FTP is closed, but when you make use class, when you transfer files from your computer to your server, you can manually open you can open port 21 so that you can easily transfer files between your computer and your server easily so in that case when you open when you open up your port 21 of your computer it also paves the way for trojans to get access to your computer okay so what does it do is that once your uh, once your uh, once port 21 we're in uh, port 21 is actually a port designed for file transfer protocol and what will happen is that if this port is open, it can now let the attacker to connect to your computer using the file transfer protocol. So normally, if they are used for developers, and usually mod, uh, the developers are prone for this attack, okay? FTP Trojans. You can connect to your computer using the file transfer protocol. Then you also have your security software disable trojan so it will disable the different security software in your computer system and again these this are designed to stop or kill security programs such as virus antiviruses firewall etc without your knowledge well you might wonder why is it my antivirus is no longer working and it's now colored red it's because your computer is now infected with a trojan and it disables your antivirus software okay that's one indication then viruses are also okay viruses are also program that infects programs or files and it needs a host and then the virus modifies a program to include a copy of the virus so it executes secretly and the host program is executed again viruses are also type of malicious software which needs a host program for these viruses to get executed because they cannot execute on their own just just like human viruses human, human viruses can cannot work without infecting the host and the same is true when you say in a computer virus um, the virus needs to infect a program before it can execute it so what it does is that it makes a copy of, its, of itself to an infected program such that when you execute the infected program this virus also gets executed and a virus is a unique program and has a unique code and it inserts in a, in a deterministic manner and then the signature of a virus refers a pattern of object code where it, where it is inserted so every virus says they have their own virus signature and one method for antivirus to detect a uh, virus software is by scanning its uh, signature of a virus or virus signature okay by scanning its virus signature the antivirus would know whether this program is malicious or not okay if the virus signature is found in its database of a of an antivirus therefore it is detected as a virus so that is just one method for the antivirus software to detect viruses by scanning its virus signature. But this is the old way. We now have uh, modern and more advanced ways to detect viruses. Okay, virus scanners can use this virus signature to identify and detect a virus. And moreover, viruses are also specific to operating systems and hardware because sometimes these viruses can only work with Windows OS and cannot work on Mac as well as on Linux or Ubuntu. And there are also viruses which can only work for mobile operating systems and cannot work under 
Windows, Ubuntu, and Mac. And there are also viruses which are only these are, there are there are also viruses which are intended for Linux OS. Okay, these are uh, some viruses which are specific only to specific operating systems and hardware. Now, uh, uh, there are also stages of computer virus in, uh, computer virus infection. Okay, so it is not an instant uh, manner, but there are stages on how a computer virus infects a computer system. And, and again, normally, or typically, a virus goes through the stage of dormancy, propagation, triggering, and execution. So, what will happen during the dormant stage? In a dormant stage, the virus is just sleeping and doing nothing in the host of a system, or the, or the host system. So it is dormant, it is not executing. It is just sleeping there, waiting for some appropriate time to execute. Well, after the dormant stage, the virus now starts to propagate by attaching itself to files and programs. Okay, After being dormant, it now starts to propagate and infect files and programs. And then take note that viruses needs a host and infect the vi to infect the computer system before it can start executing because they are only they are only executed once you run or open a file or program in your computer system. And then after propagating, the virus will be triggered and will now start executing or infecting the computer system. So that's the stages of computer virus computer virus infection. Starts with dormancy, sleeping for a period of time, then starts to propagate and infects on programs and files. And then once infected, once you open the file or program, it now gets executed and will now start and it will trigger the instruction of the virus and get executed in you in your computer and again its damages can range from simple to complex problems in your system and now what are the components of a computer virus well normally these are the different components of a viruses it has an infection mechanism wherein your infection mechanism it enables itself to replicate because it's the only way for a computer viruses to infect is to replicate itself and then there is also the trigger okay the trigger it is actually the code or the code or instruction on what a computer virus should do it is an event that makes a payload activate Again, the payload is now the code or the instruction on what the computer on what these viruses should do. The trigger is just an event to activate your payload. Again, trigger is the event to activate your payload, and then the payload it is now the actual instruction, whether it be malicious or benign. And when you say payload, it is what it does. So what the virus will do to harm your computer? That's now the payload. And then triggered is now the event which can activate your payload. And then there is an infection mechanism. And then when the infected program is invoked, it executes the virus code. And then it follows the execution of the original program code. Now there are also different classifications of computer viruses. It could be a boot sector virus. So why, why is it called boot sector virus? Now, when we say boot sector, this is a part of your computer which is responsible or which is first run the moment you turn on your computer. Okay, this is the first uh, part or it's the first sector of a computer which gets executed the moment you turn on the computer. Okay, so it may be the BIOS. So, it is called boot sector virus because it infects the boot sector of a computer system so what will happen is that it is becoming a resident in a boot sector so it now resides this type of viruses will now reside in your boot sector of a computer and they are only activated 
while booting up your computer. So every time you turn on the computer, if there is a boot sector in your computer, these viruses also gets executed. That is why you will encounter that your computer is no longer booting up. It, it is just displaying your Windows OS and it's no longer operating. And it gets restarted and restarting again and again because there is now a boot sector virus. So again, the only, they are only activated while turning on or booting up your computer and then these viruses will reside in the boot sector of your computer. Then you also have a file virus. A file virus infects programs and files and is activated when the program is run. Okay, so file virus infect programs and files. And once a program is infected with a viruses, when you run this program, the virus also gets executed. When you open up a file infected by a file virus, they are also get executed. That's what they call your file virus. Then you also have your macro virus. Okay? Macro. Now, macro is actually a feature of your Word, Excel, PowerPoint, which allows you to create uh, programs within your Word, uh, Power, PowerPoint, and Excel documents. And it is not meant to be created, uh, it, and it is not meant to create a virus but to do some useful function but then uh, hackers tried to exploit this capability okay by exploiting this capability they can create harmful code such that when you try to open up a file the instructions located in your macro also get executed and can do harmful things to your computer system okay they are embedded right into your word document excel and spreadsheet so normally, macro feature of your Word, Excel, and PowerPoint are disabled unless you turn them on. So make sure when to turn on and to turn off your macro feature of your of these software programs because otherwise your computer might get infected with a micro virus. And then they became very common in the mid 1990s since these plat since these are platform independent. And it infects documents and it quickly spread. Now, when you say macro, it is an executable program embedded in an office document and it's a form of macro language like BASIC. Now, BASIC is totally a programming language. When you create a BASIC application, it is just not like the same with creating macros for Word, Excel, and PowerPoint. And then, thus, macro virus exploits the macro capability of office apps because again word excel and powerpoint you can create or you can insert macro here so you can create programs using word excel and powerpoint so some hata some hackers tried to exploit this feature by creating viruses which is triggered every time you run this macro in your app computer and nowadays, these are now recognized by many antivirus programs. Okay, they are now recognized. These microviruses. Then another type of viruses we have is what we call your AML virus. Now, an AML virus is more of a recent development, an example of which is Melissa. And then this AML virus exploits the NS Word macro in the attached document. Such that when the attachment is opened, the macro is also activated. And then once it is activated, it sends an email to the user's address list and thus local damage to the system. And then the same thing will happen to the receipt of the email. So when you try to download the attachment, open that, so the virus or the macro virus also gets activated, copy your address list, and then sends an email and then does local damage to your system. So it's more of um, exponential function. The effect or damages then. Hence, there is a faster propagation 
in terms of an email virus. So be careful again and again in opening and downloading attachments sent by an unverified user. Then we also have a stealth virus. So what is a stealth virus? Why, why is it called stealth? Because they are, it, they are created with programming tricks which makes tracing and understanding the code very difficult. And there is a complex programming methods used to design the code. And so it is very difficult to repair the infected file. That's why they are called stealth because they are also very difficult to discovered by the antiviruses. And once the file is infected, it is uh, difficult also to repair once you are infected with a stealth virus. Then aside from stealth virus, you also have your polymorphic virus. So what is a polymorphic virus? Why is it called polymorphic? So polymorphic, there are different forms. More that is forms, poly, many. I mean to say, these viruses produces a new signature each time it's copied or transmitted. So there is a, there's a so-called class. Uh, there is a new signature created every time this virus is copied or transmitted. So it is no longer traceable. Okay, in that case, again, it's no longer traceable because a new virus signature is created then the problem here is that what if you don't update your antivirus if you don't update your antivirus there's no way for antivirus to determine this virus signature as a threat to your computer because it it is not updated therefore you have to update your antivirus software hence the virus signature may not be registered in the virus signature and the antivirus signature database for antivirus making it difficult to detect because it created a new signature therefore if the virus is not updated if the antivirus is not updated there's then there's no way for it to be detected then we also have your metamorphic virus okay polymorphic it changes its virus signature each time it's being copied or transmitted well when you say metamorphic it changes its code each time is copied or transmitted. So unlike uh, polymorphic, where it changes its virus signature, the metamorphic changes its code each time it is transmitted or copied. And then this feature makes it the antivirus program difficult to identify the virus. So those are different types of viruses. Now, what about worms? Now, worms class, these are programs which are independent because this, these are self-replicating programs which propagates themselves over the internet such as email, remote execution, and remote login. And then since worms are self-replicating, they are standalone program and does not need a host to be infected or for it to execute. So again, it doesn't need a host program, therefore they can execute and replicate itself. And it does irrevocable damage, uh, uh, irre irrecoverable damage to other system aside from speeding itself in the network. And then one of the best known worms is the Morris worms. Wherein it was released by Robert Mor Morris in the year 1988. And, it acts, and it attacks various Unix systems by cracking password files to log in or password to log into other systems. That's the Amoris worm. Another worm uh, released was a code red, which was released the year July 2001, which probes random IP addresses and makes denial of service attacks. Again, denial of service attack it is an attack wherein a server is flooded with invalid requests with no return address, and thus the server is uh, the request cannot be returned to its destination. Therefore, the, requ uh, the requests are just flowing into the network, thereby consuming its resources. And upon consuming its resources, the server can no longer cater valid requests. So that's a code red. Then also, code red 2 was also released, which includes now a backdoor. 
Then another one was released in the year 2003, the SQL um, Slammer, which attacked the MS SQL Server. When we say MS SQL Server or SQL Server, it is a computer dedicated a database server for computers in a network. So that's uh, SQL Slammer. It attacks your MS SQL Server, the database server in a network of computer. Then you also have your MyDoom which was released in the year 2004. It is a mass mailing email worm. And then this worm installed a remote access backdoor in infected systems. Then we also have the Wurzel family of worms, scan for email addresses and sends an attachment. And then we also have your mobile phone worms, wherein it first appeared in the year 2004 and targeted phones which can install the software. And then these worms can communicate via Bluetooth or MMS. And then this worm can disable a phone, delete data on the phone, or send premium priced messages. Then we also have the Com Warrior, which was launched in 2005, which also replicates using Bluetooth to nearby phones and via MMS using address book numbers. Those are some examples of worms. Again, worms are self replicating program. Since they are self-replicating, they cannot they don't need a host program for it to infect. They can infect by themselves and you can do damage just like what a computer virus can do. So a uh, worm has also its faces much like a viruses. It has dormant propagation, triggering and execution phase. So dormancy means to say the worm is just dormant and doing nothing, it's just sleeping. Then it's now starts to propagate. Then after propagating, it can now trigger the payload and then finally execute the payload. Then a worm searches for other systems to connect to it, copy it itself, and runs. So it can crawl over the network. That's a problem with worm. Because a virus, a computer virus, cannot run in a network. But a worm can travel over a network because they are, these are self-replicating. At the same time, a worm will disguise itself as a system process. And as a system process, it is allowed to do anything in your computer. And then the worm, or the word worm, was coined in the year 1975 in a novel called uh, Shockwave Rider by Jan Brunner and was implemented by Xerox Palo Alto, uh, Xerox Palo Alto uh, Labs in the year 1980s. And then finally, we have your zombies. So what are zombies? Okay. Zombies are actually computers infected with uh, infected computers, either by viruses, worms, or other malicious software, wherein these computers are launched, are used as a launching platform to launch an attack or server by flooding it with useless traffic, thereby making the network systems unavailable to serve valid requests. So, zombies, again, in short, these are just uh, infected computers with either viruses or worms, which are used to attack a server to do denial of service attacks. Okay, they are just mainly uh, used to launch a denial of service attacks to servers. That's the use of. So the more zombies that a hacker can use, the more requests that can be made, thereby allowing more chances of a server to no longer cater valid requests because they are flooded with a request or they are flooded with invalid requests with no return address. Therefore, this request cannot be sent back to its uh, uh, destination and thereby consuming the network resources and by which it can no longer cater to valid requests in a network. Okay, do you have questions or clarifications? Okay, if there's none, thanks for joining me in today's video lecture and see you on the next video for another lesson on antivirus and how do we counter these viruses. Okay, thank you and have a good day.